So I work on speech and natural language processing generally, but today I want to talk to you about a line of research we're doing relating different modalities together. It's an exciting era to be able to do this. So relating speech and vision, vision and audio, audio and text. Given the time, I'm going to go through at a high level, but just show you a number of different things that we're doing to give you, a, give you an idea. One of the areas we started, it was actually inspired from work that came out around 2015 or so on image captioning, taking an image and coming up with a text description of it. Uh, partly uh, because of our interest in learning speech, getting a machine to learn language from speech on its own, we were interested in seeing if we could take speech and pair it up with uh, vision and with no other information, see what the machine could learn from raw audio samples and raw pixels. And so we, since nothing like this existed, we went out and collected about 400,000 or so people talking two or three sentences about images. People like to do this. It's pretty easy. Uh, then we could build a uh, deep learning model, having one branch grovel over the image and another branch grovel over the audio. And then at a high level, have them connect and try and learn a uh, joint audiovisual semantic latent representation of the signal. And the interesting thing is, if you can get this to work, what it's learning in this multidimensional latent space is sort of semantic objects, their visual representation, and how they're uh, represented in the speech signal when somebody talks about uh, what they are. There's different ways to evaluate this, but the simple way I'm going to show you today is you can take a picture and then take the caption that somebody used to describe that picture, run it through the model, and it will show you where it thinks you're talking about it in the image as you're hearing it. So let me play that for you. This is a photo of a girl standing in front of a lighthouse. The little girl is wearing a blueprint dress. She has blonde hair and blue eyes. The lighthouse in the background is white with a red roof. So it's sort of like somebody shining a flashlight at a picture while you're talking. And it's not perfect, but you get a sense that on some of the concepts that you're hearing, it sort of knows what you're talking about. You can quantify this a little bit more by looking through a large data set and finding patches and images that have high correspondence with segments in the speech uh, captions and pooling them together and then clustering. And you get hundreds and hundreds of these kinds of clusters. Here's an example here of uh, nine images that all fall into the, into the same cluster. And I'll play you uh, three examples of audio that also fall into a related cluster. Castle. Castle had castle. So you see, it, it sort of gets the concept. The train. The train. The train. The lighthouse. The lighthouse. A lighthouse. The sunset. The sunset. Sunset. Here in New England, we like uh, lighthouses and sunsets, apparently. Uh, but you get the idea. We didn't tell it any of this stuff. It just figured it all out um, on its own. Uh, the other interesting thing is we did this original work in English, but it works on any language. For example, you can use an image as a kind of interlingua or Rosetta Stone, if you will. And if you have multiple languages, you can have people in different languages independently talking about what they see in the picture. They don't have to be the same thing. And by modifying the original architecture to include branches for different languages and jointly learning this high-level uh, semantic embedding space, you can make connections between the languages without having any direct connections before. So let me show you for English and Hindi a couple of different clusters that, that pop out. For people are... There are many people say, and some people... Top of a body of water. This a picture of water and... Love a lake. You'll notice you might have heard body of water and lake, and that's because it's being represented semantically. It's not phonetically or anything like that. So after doing this kind of work with still images, we wanted to move to video. So that's what we did. Video has a couple of advantages. Generally, if you take something like an instructional video, like cooking videos, there's so many cooking videos of in different languages out there in the world, or videos about how to fix your bike or woodworking or, or things like that, you're generally seeing things that people are talking about, and the speech comes for free in the video. You don't have to go out and collect it from people. The other thing that's nice about video is you get background sounds, non-speech audio that is often related to the semantic objects that you're seeing. So again, you can modify that basic model to have a visual branch that's processing video and an audio branch that's processing speech and uh, the audio sounds and learn a high level embedding space. And you can do things like retrieval, 
of uh, play, it, play an audio snippet and retrieve the corresponding video snippet and things like that. But due to time, I want to move on. Uh, we've done a lot of learning from raw audio, uh, like the audio that you extract from YouTube videos and things like that. You can learn it in a supervised way with a deep learning model where you take a audio input in the form of a spectrogram, a time frequency representation of the audio, and you tell it what audio tags are associated with that segment. Or you can have it learn in a self-supervised way where you mask out parts of the spectrogram and have it try to reconstruct that or be able to distinguish the true original um, portion versus imposters. Uh, when you do that, you can get quite good state-of-the-art results on audio classification. I'm going to play you a audio uh, example. So listen carefully, see what you think it is. Okay, you have an idea? This is what the model thought it was. It, it primarily picked out the owl. And if you look on the, uh, your right-hand side, at the top is a spectrogram. You hear the crickets and the owl hooting. And at the very bottom is an attention map. And you can see that the model, in this case, is mostly paying attention to the owl, which is why it gave it the highest priority. You can also combine audio with video and do a joint audio encoding and a video encoding, encode them together, and in a self-supervised way without any annotations whatsoever, learn a joint audiovisual embedding space. And you can do things like retrieval there, where you play a uh, audio snippet and retrieve appropriate video, or play a video segment and retrieve appropriate. Due to time, I want to switch. You can combine all of these types of perceptual models to do a general form of scene analysis. So you can do speech recognition to transcribe what's being said. You can also be doing audio classification to be listing background sounds that you have. So for example, here in the yellow, we have the audio tags. And in the green, we this have nice the uh, speech. medium high. And oh, I love that sizzle. The rest of the onions and the rest of the garlic and you can imagine combining that with vision as well. The last thing I want to touch on from a research point of view, where we're going, I think is very interesting, is combining these perceptual models with language models. So you can actually have a conversation with a model about what it heard or saw and why. So going back to the owl example, we've hooked up with a large language model. So you can say, well, what did you hear? And it gives a little description of the scene. And then you say, did you hear any insects? And they said, oh, yeah, I heard some crickets. You know, and, and then when do you, then you can do more esoteric things like, well, when do you think this was recorded? Would this be good background for a, a, a movie? And it gives its opinion. You know, there's no end to what you could get into here. Um, so that's all I wanted to show you. Final thoughts. Deep learning has really enabled us to make connections across modalities. It's, it's fascinating. Self-supervised learning has let us learn from large quantities of unannotated data. And these newer large language models is going to be a really interesting research direction to connect perception with language, two of the original pillars of artificial intelligence. And last, I'd like to uh, thank the people here are the primary people involved in the research I talked about. And that's it. Thanks. Thanks.